that flowed through a mountainous province in Japan, there lived a childless woodcutter and his wife. To all the children in the neighbourhood, they were known with warm affection as Grandmama and Grandpapa, because in spite of their poverty, they always remembered to keep a part of their small meal for the hungry young people who came to greet them daily. It grieved them greatly that they were childless, and always as their young friends turned homewards and their charming voices showered the evening air with their thanks and goodbyes and good nights, they would slide the paper screen doors of their small house together and pause, silent and dejected, as if they could not bear to enclose the emptiness within. One fine morning, Grandmama decided to wash their winter kimonos in the river. In customary fashion, she drew out the threads that held the long seams together and took the kimonos apart piece by piece. Gathering them into a rice straw basket, she went down to the river bank. The river tripped and lilted in the sunshine, swinging round bends, sidling by rocks and shooting through the mosses of the shallows. Skimming birds played with the flies, the flies with the jumping fish, and the willow trees dipped their long branches to, into the cool water. The river curled and eddied through Grandmama's fingers and round her sun-baked arms as she chanted, Jabu Jabu, Jabu Jabu, to the rhythm of her washing. The sun and the river cheered her old wintry body, flooding it with the warmth of summer and soon her work was done. She laid the kimono strips along the bank to dry and was about to start from home when she noticed a round object riding and tossing on the breast of the river. It rounded the bend just beyond. It was buoyant as a cork and even the most ebullient eddies could not douse it. As it came near, she saw first the soft curved ripeness and then the bloom furred skin of a golden peach. Its glowing skin, tinged with blushes, outshone the golden day. In all her life, she had never seen a peach so big or so beautiful. Quickly tucking her kimono above her knees, she stepped into the river and waded out into the waters. And the waters brushed her ground. The peach rode gently towards her. She reached out her arms, but a sudden eddy sent it just beyond her reach, and there it spiralled and danced as if teasing her eager longing. She turned and started wading back when suddenly the eddy moved towards her, bringing the peach bobbing to her side. Folding her hands round the wet velvety skin, she lifted it out of the water and returned to the bank. She arrived home panting and breathless with the weight of it, but brimming with happiness at the thought of her prize brought safely home. The dusk came and with it the clack clock of her husband's wooden shoes on the stony path outside. Barely had he time to put down his day's gathering of wood when Grandmama rushed out and flooded him with the tale of her golden find. Grandpapa laughed at her excitement as he kicked off his wooden shoes and stepped onto the straw matting of their only room. Before him lay the peach, its smooth and glowing warmness filling the whole room. His eyes, still closed in a twinkling line of laughter, slowly opened in amazement. He touched the peach to ensure himself that it was real. And then he sat down on the floor, his legs tucked under him, to gaze at this miracle of all peaches. It would be a glory to eat it. When they had finished their simple meal of rice and dried fish, Grandmama cleaned the big kitchen knife. Together they put their hands on the haft and gently sliced down the golden cleft of the peach. As it fell apart, there was a stirring in the heart of the fruit. They fell back in fear as a boy, cheerful as the first green of spring, stepped out before their astounded eyes. He smiled at their incredulous wonder, and with a swift confiding movement, turned to Grandmama and pulled the folds of her apron around him. He rested tranquilly against her knees while the old couple sat spellbound. Long they remained, silent and motionless, but with hope rising in their hearts that the Buddha had at last relented and sent a child to them in the evening of their days.
And so indeed it proved. For as the seasons of the planting and the gathering of the rice came and went, the boy gave nothing but pleasure and happiness in his new home, and Grandmama and Grandpapa never ceased to rejoice in their good fortune. They called him Mamutaro, the son of a peach. And as the months rounded into years, Mamutaro grew sturdy of body and firm of limb. His skin glowed tan and rosy gold, and he carried with him a stoutness of heart and a sweetness of disposition that might well be attributed to his strange foster mother. One day, soon after he had reached his 15th birthday, Mamutaro asked leave to address his parents on a matter of great importance. Greatly wondering, they waited for him to speak. Mamutaro bowed low to them in filial piety and then said, Honourable Grandpapa, Honourable Grandmama, though I became your son in a most unusual way, I can never cease to be grateful to you for the good and disciplined manner in which you have brought me to manhood. Your kindness has been wider than the horizon of the sky and your love has flowed over me with the fullness of the river that brought me to you. Never before had they heard him speak with such seriousness. No longer was it the voice of their happy child. Before them stood Momotaro for all his smallness and youth grown into manhood. Overcome with the tenderness of Momotaro's words and at the same time sensing that behind their seriousness lay some firm decision that would affect the joy of their home, Grandmama began to weep. Grandpapa, remembering the days of his own youth and the first time he had wished to prove his manhood, guessed that Momotaro was longing to go into the world to try his fortune and before the boy could continue, he said, My son, I can guess what you are going to say. And though we shall taste the bitterness of loneliness without you, yet I applaud the courage of your spirit that prompts you to this course. Please do not allow our sorrow or the tears of your mother to deter you. Only we beg you, always remember that we shall be waiting for you for as long as our fading years permit, and our poor hut will forever be your home. You read my thoughts well, Honourable Grandpapa, replied Momotaro with the same serious bearing. And when the time comes for me to leave, your understanding will make our parting easier. But when will you go? wept Grandmama, unable to control her tears. When will you go? Beyond the hills of our village and the river of our valley? The world is angry and evil. It is no place for you. It is beyond the hills of our village and the river of our valley that I must go, and without a moment to lose, said Momotaro. And for no other reason than to quell that anger and to put good where evil reigns. He paused and then continued. It is a long story, and I fear that I shall weary you with the telling of it. In the ocean that washes the shores of our country, there is an island of evil. It is inhabited by fearful horned ogres. They are taller than the tallest bamboo in the forest, and their hearts know only darkness. The skins of some are red as the belching flames of Mount Fuji. Some are as blue as the ocean's stormy depths, and some as green as the eyes of cats at night, and some are as black as the evil in their hearts. They come in swift boats to our shores to ravage and pillage the countryside, devouring the children and leaving grief, destruction and death everywhere behind them. I am going to brave these monsters on their own island and exterminate them. I will bring back to Japan all the treasures they have stolen and restore them to their rightful owners. At this, Grandmama's tears redoubled. But Grandpapa checked her and said sharply, Do not be so foolish, wife. This is no time for tears, and certainly no time to display them. Our son is brave, his cause is just, and Buddha who sent them to us will protect him. Until today he has been a boy, now he is to prove himself a man. 
therefore cease these useless tears and help the boy to equip himself for the long journey and the battles that lie before him. With these words, Grandpapa went out to the woods to cut Momotaro a stout staff. Grandmama, drying her tears, took from the cupboard a bag of millet and began grinding the seed in a heavy mortar. There she made the ground millet into dumplings and cooked them over the charcoal fire. Very soon, Grandpapa returned with a stout branch. He stripped off the bark, bearing the gleaming white wood, which he speedily polished into a shining staff. When all was prepared and Momotaro was about to leave, Grandpapa took from a latter box a warrior's iron fan and with many exhortations and blessings handed it to Momotaro who tucked it into his kimono sash. All knelt on the floor and bowed deeply many times. No words were spoken and no grief showed in their faces. The depth of their silent bowing expressed only too well the sorrow in their hearts. Finally, Momotaro took his leave and his grandparents watched the valiant little figure stride into the distance. For a moment, he turned and all bowed their last farewell before he disappeared over the brow of the hill. Now they could only wait and offer prayers at the family altar for his safe and speedy return. Once he had overcome the sadness of parting, strode forward full of exuberance. It was good to be out in the world, and he came to know it. He knew the justice of his cause, and he walked the whole morning and deep into the afternoon. The rice fields had long been left behind him as he climbed hill and mountain. Peak after peak had passed and now a valley with a coppice in it laid before him. He stepped aside into the trees, and for the first time since he left home, he prepared to smooth the raw edge of his hunger. He had hardly untied his bag of dango when he heard a sudden scuffling behind him, and leaping to his feet, he saw a large and lordly dog bound from an entanglement of bushes. The dog snarled fiercely and barked in a deep voice, who gave you leave to travel through my country? I am the Lord Brindled Dog, and all who come here must obey and pay homage to me. If they don't, I will bite off their heads. He snarled again and looked as fierce as a jungle full of tigers. Mamutaro, instead of melting with fear, started laughing at his comical face. Lord Brindled Dog, I think you are more bark than bite. I am not afraid of you. With these words, Momotaro waved his staff before the lordly creature, who suddenly, with his tail between his legs, retreated to a safe distance, before saying in a most conciliatory voice, You must be the famous Momotaro, the Momotaro that even the winds speak of, and of whose coming the pike in the river tell tales. Do tell me the honour of informing what brings you into my domain. Momotaro smiled at the Lord Brindled Dog's sudden change of tone, but willingly told him of his plans to exterminate the ogres. Lord Brindled Dog's ears and tail reared stiff in excitement. Those are the monsters who killed my brindled heir and devastated my lands. I vowed vengeance, and now my hour has come. Momotaro-sana, take me with you. I am big and strong. I can run faster than the fastest creature on land. With my crunching jaws and sword-edged teeth, I can snap their heads from their bodies in one bite. The 
proof of that pudding will be in the eating of it, chuckled Mamutaro. And he agreed to have Lord Brindle Dog as his fighting companion. They set out together, having first refreshed themselves by sharing one of the dango millet dumplings and travelled quickly on the way. Lord Brindle Dog was ever speeding ahead, snuffling the ground and smelling out the best track for them to follow. Mile after mile sped under their feet until towards evening they came to a small hollow among the foothills of a mountain. Here they decided to rest for the night. They settled down under the spreading branches of a tree but hardly had their heads touched their pillows of leaves when there was a rustling commotion overhead and a handsome monkey came swinging down with long-armed grace to their feet. He bowed to Momotaro and said with charming politeness, You are undoubtedly the Lord Momotaro, of whom all the forests and mountains have heard. I have come to offer my services in the task of righteousness and justice that you have undertaken. I am the Lord Monkey of this mountain, and I beg you to accept me as your retainer. Lord Brindle Dog, when he heard these words, jumped, snarling forwards, and yelped, I am Lord Momotaro's retainer, and he needs no other. What use would a monkey be in making battle against monsters and giants? Be off with you to the treetops where you belong. But the Lord Monkey of the Mountain remained calm and looked steadily at Momotaro. Momotaro liked him at once and his mind was made up. You, Lord Brindled Dog, if you really wish to serve me faithfully, you will remember that there is an arduous and dangerous task ahead of us. You will need all your battle energy for that time. Do not waste it now. Come, Lord Monkey of the Mountain. Here is a millet dumpling. Share it with Lord Brindled Dog. I am happy to have you as my second retainer. As the first hazy light of morning filtered through the branches above them, Momotaro and his two retainers rose up, yawned and set off on their way. The air was full of the perfume of wild flowers, and the trees and bushes were astir with the movement and song of the little bush warblers. It seemed a day full of promise to the three warriors as they strode off on their way. Lord Brindled Dog bounded ahead with Momotaro's staff. Lord Monkey swung gracefully above their heads from tree to tree, and Momotaro himself strode out blithely, carrying his fan in his hand as befitted a lordly warrior. Foothills gave place to forests, forests to winding streams, and winding streams to moorland. It was country that delighted Lord Brindle's dog's heart. He ran and leaped and snuffled and panted, Suddenly, before his quivering nose, a pheasant rose out of the gorse. Startled, the dog dropped Momotaro's staff and immediately sprang forward to bite the pheasant's head. The pheasant, undaunted, whirled in the air and swooped to attack the dog. Momotaro watched and thought, What a valiant creature! Just the follower I would have with me. He picked up the fallen staff and brought it down with a thud on Lord Brindled Dog's rump sternly ordering him to stop fighting. At the same time, he spoke sharply to the pheasant and said, Who are you that dare molest my personal retainer? We are bound on a most important expedition, and you're causing us much delay. On hearing Momotaro's voice, the bird crouched low near his feet and said, Ah, you must be the great Lord Momotaro, of whom all the moorfowl have heard. I am the humble Lord Pheasant of the Moor. I and my bird retainers know of your noble undertaking. We are wholeheartedly behind you, and my only wish is to be allowed to serve under your leadership. Momotaro was delighted with his new ally, and taking out another millet dumpling, he shared it among them all. Then all four continued across the moorland, the monkey riding on the dog's back and the pheasant flying overhead and occasionally perching on Momotaro's shoulder. The morning passed in noon, and soon the scrub-covered moors were far behind. A wood of tall bamboo trees stretched endlessly through the afternoon, and the four valiant heroes walked, ambled, hopped, and swung under the cool shade of the leaves. Dusk was just falling gently over the forest when they emerged to see before them 
the blue expanse of the ocean. All four sat down, dusty, tired and hungry, but overjoyed to be facing their first objective. They scanned the sea's glassy surface, but nothing rose to break its quiet immensity. We will sleep here tonight, and tomorrow morning we will build a boat and start our search for the ogre's island, said Momotaro. light of dawn, Lord Momotaro was up and directing his three followers. Lord Brindled Dog felled the bamboo trees with savage bites of his fierce jaws. Lord Pheasant of the Moor brought long strands of creeper from distant fields to bind the trunks together. Lord Monkey of the Mountain and Momotaro worked quickly and deftly, and soon their craft was shipshape and was launched. Lord Brindled Dog took charge of the oar which swivelled on a wooden pin at the stern of the boat. His strong, powerful curving strokes sent the boat speeding through the waveless blue. The land fell out of sight and the sun rose high in the sky. All day the little boat moved further and further out to sea. But from one end of the horizon to the other, there was no sign of an island to be seen, nothing but the vast murmuring expanse of the ocean. Lord Pheasant of the Moor, now is the time for you to use your special gift of flight, said Momotaro. Go before us and see what there is to be seen from your vantage point in the sky. The pheasant rose swiftly in the air and flew towards the horizon, mounting steadily higher and higher until he vanished from sight. It seemed a long time to those waiting before the bright wings that at last reappeared. Lord Momotaro, I have seen the island's outline. It is still far away, but with good luck and swift rowing, we should reach there before nightfall, cried the pheasant overhead. Follow me and I will direct you. Following the pheasant who flew on ahead, Lord Brindled Dog rowed with renewed strength and sent the boat skimming over the water. It was not long before a dot appeared on the skyline, which gradually grew into the outline of the island they sought. As they drew closer, its grim forbidding look, its air of ironclad isolation, cast a gloom upon the whole surroundings and made even the peach stone heart of Momotaro chill for a moment. Looking at his followers, he saw that the dog's hair bristled along his spine and the monkey was chattering to himself in quiet undertones. Only the pheasant, now settled on his shoulder, looked unconcerned, his beady eyes as bright and as alert as ever. At the command of Momotaro, Lord Brindle Dog rode quietly inshore. From there, Momotaro could just see through the falling dusk the ogre's fortifications. A high iron railed fence on the lower reaches and behind but further up the rocky hill, a heavily spiked wall which encircled a massive fortress-like building. That, concluded Momotaro, holds our enemies. He directed the boat to ground in the shelter of a large rock which jutted out beyond the iron-railed fence. And there he took counsel with his followers. He explained to them his plan of attack, which had been been formulating in his mind since he first saw the island's defences. They would attack under the cover of darkness, but first they would rest a little to regain their strength. It was their best chance of success, if shrewdness, which they must depend upon, was to beat the mighty ogres. At the cho 
euros an hour. They started for the iron fence. Lord Brindle Dog quickly made an opening by biting through several of the uprights, and he and Momotaro stationed themselves, one at each side of the massive wooden doors, in the inner wall. Lord Monkey scaled the wall and waited at the top. Lord Pheasant went winging high over the fortress and alighted on the topmost turret. Suddenly, in the still darkness, the pheasant shrilled out his clear challenge. Ken Ken! Ken Ken! Ken Ken! A cry which he knew all mortals took for the warning of an earthquake. The ogres, bleary-eyed with sleep, stumbled out into the darkness of the yard. The pheasant screeched again, whilst the monkey ran along the walls, tearing up the stones and hurling them at the heads of the ogres. Bewildered, the monsters flung open the great wooden doors, their howls filling the night. As they came through in blind confusion, Momotaro struck their legs with his dagger, and as they stumbled, Lord Brindle Dog tore from their heads. Lord Pheasant swooped in fury out of the dark sky and blinded them with his sharp beak. Lord Brindle Dog snapped his iron jaws at them. Lord Monkey tore the hair from their heads with his strong fingers. The few who escaped rushed in panic to their boats but were blinded by Lord Pheasant before they could reach them. Only the ogre chief was left when morning came over the distant skyline. Surveying the ravages about him, he knew that defeat had come to him at last. He broke off his horns, and taking the keys of his fortress treasure house, he laid them at the feet of Lord Momotaro in a token of submission. Leaving Lord Brindle Dog to guard the ogre chief, Momotaro, with the pheasant and the monkey, went to ransack the storehouse for the treasures he had dreamed of returning to Japan. Many he saw that he thought had disappeared forever. The precious stone with which the tides could be controlled, the garments which rendered their wearer invisible, the mallet which struck showers of gold at every blow, the precious coal which a famed empress had brought from the depths of the ocean, and many priceless treasures of musk, emeralds, tortoiseshell, gold, silver, and amber. All these they loaded into one of the ogre's boats and then set out for home, leaving the ogre chief solitary among his evil dead. The flowing breeze bellied their sails. The tide ran fast in their course, and before long, Lord Pheasant of the Moor announced from his heaven-high lookout that the coastline of their beloved Japan was once again in sight. Joyfully, they landed and once set about, set about a building. And into that building they loaded all the treasures from the ogre's storehouse. And in that building they crafted a little cart. Soon they were eagerly striding homewards through forests and moorlands, as Momotaro descended the very last hill with his faithful followers, there before him lay the village, with Grandpapa and Grandmama standing at the door of their little hut, waiting to welcome him home. They bowed deeply, and their eyes told the depth of the happiness in their hearts. The time had seemed endless whilst he had been away, but now it flew faster than the wings of morning, as he told of all that had befallen him. Taro's grandparents lived for many golden years to enjoy their good fortune that their wonderful son had brought them, and Momotaro became a powerful but kindly and just lord as the years went by. Lord Brindled Dog, Lord Monkey of the Mountain, and Lord Pheasant of the Moor remained always his closest friends, paying him frequent visits from their own domains, where in turn he was always a most honoured guest. And Momotaro spent the rest of his life in using the powers that the ogre's magic treasures had given them for the welfare of his people.